The Long Road to Justice, the story of Simon Wiesenthal. Written by Daniela Lurion and Melissa Michael. Illustrated by Elena Kingsbury. Simon Wiesenthal was an artist, an architect, an author, a Holocaust survivor, and following his liberation from the concentration camps of Nazi-occupied Europe, he became known as a Nazi hunter, a title he struggled to accept. While it was true he pursued Nazi war criminals following the war, he felt the Nazi hunter title sounded like he was just trying to get revenge. He had witnessed unimaginable horrors during the Holocaust and believed that the men and women who had carried out these crimes needed to be held accountable. But Simon did not see his work as revenge or getting even. He saw it as a pursuit of justice. To understand the work that Simon did after the Second World War, we must learn about his life before the war. It was a cold night on New Year's Eve, 1908, in Buchach, present-day Ukraine, when Asher and Rosa Wiesenthal welcomed their firstborn child, a son they named Simon. The couple had settled in Buchach after fleeing anti-Semitic violence in the Russian Empire. You see, Jewish people were being targeted and attacked simply because they were Jewish. Asher and Rosa Wiesenthal were Jewish. They wanted to find a safe place to raise their family and hoped that they would find that safety in Buchach. When Simon was only five years old, his childhood was interrupted by the First World War. It was not long before the Austro-Hungarian Empire conscripted Simon's father into a Jewish unit of the army and sent him away to the front line. The family waited anxiously for news only to find out Asher had been wounded on the battlefield and died in hospital shortly after. After the tragic death of his father and the horrors of the First World War, Simon and his family started to rebuild their lives. Simon spent his free time sitting on the floor using little white sugar cubes to create houses and other structures. He remembered his grandmother pointing to one of his sugar cube villages and telling his mother, he is going to be a master builder one day. See how beautifully he made this? Simon attended a local high school in Buchach and immediately stood out among his fellow classmates. Even though he was not at the top of his class, Simon had a keen eye for art and design and a sense for mischief. While at school, much of his attention was focused solely on one classmate, Silla Mueller. The young girl sat in front of him at school with her long, golden blonde hair tied into braids. Every so often, Simon would tug on one of her braids to try to get a reaction. Scylla, on the other hand, took care not to respond to his teasing, choosing instead to ignore young Simon entirely. Upon graduating, Simon applied to the Lviv Polytechnic National University, but was refused because he was Jewish. The university would only accept a few Jewish students. Instead, Simon attended the Technical University of Prague, where he received his degree in architectural engineering in 1932. In 1936, Simon and Scylla got married. The newlyweds had plans to start a family and peacefully enjoy life together. Simon and Scylla's conversations about their life together and making plans for the future changed suddenly on September 1st, 1939 when Germany invaded Poland and started the Second World War. Not just a war of country against country with soldiers against soldiers. This was also a war against certain kinds of people. The leader of Nazi Germany, Adolf Hitler, wanted to take control of other countries and their land for his own. But he also wanted to get rid of people he hated. You see, according to Hitler, there were some people who were better than others based on religion, race, sexuality, and personal and political beliefs. But there was one group that Hitler hated most of all, and that was the Jewish people. When the Second World War began, Simon and Scylla, like many others, were scared. They did not know what the future held. They hoped the war would end quickly. 
but it did not. Late in 1941, Scylla and Simon were sent to the Lvov ghetto in occupied Poland. Their crime? They were Jewish. Not long after, they were moved to the Janowska concentration camp and separated. Simon was given prisoner number 504 and placed in an overcrowded hut with little food to eat. He painted signs until his professional training was discovered and he was put to work using his skills in architecture. While in Janowska, Simon had an experience that stayed with him for the rest of his life. Every once in a while, he would be taken out of the camp by a guard to work on some sort of job. On this day, he was taken into the local town. In a rare moment of conversation, the guard, SS Corporal Mertz, turned to Simon and asked, Suppose you were taken on a magic carpet to the United States. What would you tell people there? How was it in the concentration camps? How had they treated the Jews? Simon paused for a moment to think about his answer. He told SS Corporal Mertz, I believe I would tell the truth. Laughing at this response, SS Corporal Mertz replied, they would think you were crazy. They would never believe you. It was at this moment that Simon realized he needed to survive. He needed to survive to prove the SS Corporal wrong. He needed to survive so he could tell the world what happened. There needed to be survivors to tell the truth about the terrible things happening to Jewish people all across Europe. Scylla was first to escape Janowska. With fake identification papers that changed her name and said that she was not Jewish, Scylla traveled to Warsaw, hoping no one would recognize her and that she could pretend to be a Polish citizen. Simon was next to escape and go into hiding. He hid in different places, like an attic, a closet, and even under some floorboards to try to escape the Nazis. However, he was discovered in a raid by the secret police called the Gestapo and was sent to Plachow concentration camp in Nazi-occupied Poland. This began his journey through a series of concentration camps. Simon was sent from Plachow to Auschwitz, from there on to Gross Rosen and Buchenwald, before finally arriving at Mauthausen concentration camp on February 9, 1945. Simon was on board the last train that arrived there. He witnessed terrible crimes carried out against his fellow prisoners. Simon tried to pay attention and record in his mind the crimes he was witnessing. He continued to question why this was happening. How could being Jewish be a crime? How could someone hate Jewish people so much that they would try to hurt them and take their lives? Freedom finally came for Simon on May 5th, 1945. Tanks with giant white stars arrived at the gates of Mauthausen the American army had arrived. The Nazi guards in the towers were gone and the war was finally over. But what does freedom mean when almost everyone you knew and everything you owned are gone? Simon found his answer a few days later. In an administrative office on the grounds of the camp, a group of former prisoners interrogated shackled former SS men, all under the watch of American soldiers. Simon thought back to his conversation with Corporal Murs several years earlier. The SS Corporal had said no one would believe what happened in the Holocaust because the crimes were so enormous. Simon believed what he had seen was really the worst of what human beings could do to other human beings. He knew he had to do something to prove SS Corporal Murs wrong and to make sure the world knew the truth of what had happened. He immediately volunteered to help in any way he could. The War Crimes Office tasked Simon with writing down everything he could remember about his time in the Nazi concentration camps. Every person, every place, every date. By the summer of 1945, though he truly feared the worst, Simon set out to find what had happened to Scylla. He wrote to a friend in Poland asking for help in locating his wife. Miraculously, word arrived a short while later that Scylla had survived. Simon remembered the first conversation he and Scylla had after reuniting. He asked her, who from our families is still alive? It was a difficult question, repeated by survivors across Europe. For Simon and Scylla, the answer soon became clear. Together, 
They created a list of 89 family members killed in the Holocaust. This shock was difficult for the young couple to process. Simon struggled, knowing he had survived when so many others had not. He wanted his survival to mean something. Simon wanted justice. Justice, however, would not be an easy thing for him to find. Simon continued to believe that those who had committed crimes during the Holocaust needed to be held accountable, no matter how much time had passed since the end of the war. He decided to open his own documentation center in Vienna, where he gathered evidence, proof of the crimes, and tried to find where these men and women were living. Once he gathered the information, he handed it over to the court systems. It would then be left up to a judge and jury to determine the guilt of the Nazi perpetrators and what the consequences of their actions would be. Simon dedicated his life to the pursuit of justice against those who carried out crimes of the Holocaust. He was responsible for the arrest of almost 1,100 Nazi criminals. After the war, Simon and Silla began talking again about starting their own family but struggled knowing that any children they might have would grow up never having grandparents, aunts, uncles, or cousins. The young couple was also deeply aware that the only way to move forward was to honor the legacy of those who had perished. Their daughter, Pauline Rosa Wiesenthal, was born in September 1946. Her name honored her two grandmothers, both of whom died in the Holocaust. Simon and Scylla tried to protect their only child from the outside world. However, Simon's work as a Nazi hunter often forced him to go against popular opinion, making him a regular target of threats. This never bothered Simon much until the danger reached Pauline. To try to protect her and keep her safe, Pauline began going to and from school with a police escort. For Simon, the dangers would continue but he carried out his Nazi hunting efforts until he retired in 2001 at the age of 92. Simon died peacefully in his home in Vienna on September 20, 2005 at the age of 96. He received many awards for his work in the pursuit of justice. However, he was often asked why he didn't just leave the past alone and move on with his life. Simon said he believed that one day, when he died, he would meet those who had been killed in the Holocaust, and they would ask him what he did with his survival. He wanted to be able to say to them, I have never forgotten you. Simon dedicated his life to making the world a better place. He wanted those who committed terrible crimes to know there would be consequences for their actions. Simon also believed in the power of education. He wanted young people to learn about the history of the Holocaust and use the lessons to stand up for freedom in the world today. As Simon once said, freedom is not a gift from heaven. You have to fight for it every day of your life. Welcome back to the Human Rights Story Corner and Happy New Year from the FSWC education team. We hope you have a great year and stay tuned for more content coming soon. The link to the study guide is located in the bio of this video. Till next time.